Welcome to Raise the Brow. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Nishka. It's always a delight speaking with you and um, your podcast, your show has always, you know, raises my brow for sure. <laughs> and I'm sure it does for the people as well. I love that you're saying that. I love I love a little plug in of my podcast every time a guest comes on. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> always. This is this is the third time we are attempting to do this or the second time remind me I think this is the second time we're doing this right Yeah 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 it's second time I think we've had three four conversations and this is the second time we're attempting to record a podcast Nice I think we are warmed up at this point Absolutely Yeah <laughs> So for those of you who are listening and for those of you who are watching Tenzin is many things she is a trainer i'm going to read my notes i don't want to miss anything she's a trainer presenter writer translator and a tedx speaker and she does a lot of social work as well so tenzin you wear a thousand hats how are you doing today how are you doing in the pandemic how are you doing right now well everything that one can ask for um i have the gratitude to work at because during the course of this pandemic i have realized something that um we all must be conscious of our mortality uh that everything is not here uh forever that we are not here forever so that, that sort of fuels my passion and accelerates me to work even harder to work even more in this direction and uh You know, yes, I wear multiple hats on a professional front. Yes, it is challenging at times, but um I always see that uh, you know, taking the risks and having the ability or even the courage to be able to take those risks, they make me more wiser and experiences they make you much more wiser. So, um over the course of years for me now I uh, have learned more specifically is that um you know, time, time is the best teacher. and your experiences if they sure are your best teacher. Yeah, that is so perfectly put. You are so articulate. You are so a TEDx speaker. <laughs> 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 so let's talk a little bit about uh, let's go back in time. Like how did you come to the point of where you are right now? Um I know from our earlier conversations that you started working as a teenager. And when I say working, you actually had a job in which you earned money, you traveled and you had some hard conversations. It wasn't like a random job teenagers have where they just, you know, faff around, have fun and earn some pocket money. So, let's talk a little bit about the work you did as a teenager and let's dive a little deeper into how that experience kind of, you know, molded you. Absolutely, Nishka. Well, yes, I did start very young, um and that also is a leverage for me because when you start so young, you have more cumulative experience. Uh and, you know, that is always something that has been to my advantage because uh when kids were still trying to figure out what they wanted to do, I was already working. So it was a whole new experience for me. Also, I did realize there is a dichotomy between my world and the world of my friends, the world of kids, teenagers at my age, my peers. Um yes, at the age uh that where I'm supposed to play and explore and um you know be more imaginative and dream as to what um my future could hold or look like. I was sitting there um in a room full of diplomats, in a room full full of ministers and officials discussing policies. So um sometimes I do feel like I matured up too soon but um I think everything happens for a reason. Uh like my mom always says that um if you're just trying to do something and if that is the right time you will do it no matter what. Um so yes, uh I think that um starting young has always been a leverage for me and I started at the age of 15 more to be precise, right? Uh before that I did do a lot of volunteering work and you know a lot of social work but um you know working also as a translator for the regional Tibetan administration um that was a different experience because uh in my family I've always been 
uh, told to give back to my community because um, I think that's very important, right? That is a very important aspect of societies is that we not only take from them, but also give back. And that could be in a very simple form, in a very small manner. Uh, for, for my end, it was translation. It was being the bridge between cultures and, and people and trying to sort of improve relations between communities, both the Indian community and the Tibetan community. Um, and also to invigorate more and more Tibetan children to be more ambitious in life. Because mm -hmm. uh, when you come from a more Buddhist perspective, uh, we say that, you know, being too ambitious is not good. It's, it's you know, co-relevant to, you know, being greedy. Uh, but that's not true. You need to go with the time that is today. You live in the 21st century. Yes, have your aesthetics, have your principles. But with that, be in alignment with the generation that is today. We need to go with time. So I always try my best to do that. Man, I love that. And, you know, I, I just want to pick up on one of the things that you said, that um, one of the Buddhist ideologies or teachings or in culture itself, uh, there is a belief that too much ambition is bad, right? And this is something I think is predominantly quite South Asian. Like all of us have grown up hearing this, right? Like, don't be too proud. Um, don't go chasing money. Don't go chasing fame or... You know, stay humble, be grounded. Um, I often find that I think that teaching is a little, I think it's a little skewed. I think, you know, I wish we were taught to be ambitious, um, but in the right way. Ambition doesn't have to be ugly. It can be beautiful. It, it is a drive in the end. And instead, in our cultures, we are made to feel bad about being ambitious. I don't think that has changed much. And I think as adults, like you mm. see it even more, I feel, in conversations, unless you're part of like, you know, a very, um, a group which thinks very differently, a, a group which is privileged to think above that. And I think most of us are part of those circles, but more often than not, there are these conversations which happen that not jobs aren't everything, goals aren't everything, ambition isn't everything. So does that happen yeah. to you also? It does, right? Like, well, I personally feel that ambition, um, if it harms others, then of course it is it is bad. But if your ambition, if you being successful, you're able to help others as well, then there's nothing better than that. Yeah. So I personally feel it is how you look at it, even knowledge, right? Human knowledge. We could either use it for the welfare of our human society or use it against it. That is why we have all these attacks going on, right, in the world. How we use our intelligence, how we use this energy is really important. And for me, uh, being ambitious, as you very rightly mentioned, um, doesn't have to be all bad. It can be for the good of people. Yeah. Yeah, I think ambition is beautiful. I wish I wish all of us as kids were taught that, that ambition has, you know, a greater role to play than absolutely having no ambition and pretending like you don't have ambitions. I think that is worse. Yeah. Yeah. And so, because, yeah, as human beings, we have uh, the power of planning the future, which most of the other animals don't have. Only we have that. We can plan, oh, what do we need to do tomorrow? We have the power of imagination. So um, I always ask myself these questions. I also, um, you know, ask other people who say that I don't have any purpose or no ambition. I say you're born as a human being and maybe you'll only be born once. Do you want to waste it like this? So, Oh, that should be a t-shirt. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you start selling merchandise as well, Tens, and you can just add it to the list of things that you're doing. Add buy it. Yeah, surely. <laughs> that is now in my head. Now I'm marking that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you were 15 when you started working. Um, I'm imagining myself when I was 15, um, 15 is a hard age. There's a lot happening. Your body is changing. Your mind is like, you know, it's in a new world altogether. 
um i think the conversations around you change quite a bit sort of emphasis suddenly on your future education and of course people you're attracted to there is so much going on right um and of course there's this constant um feeling of um what am i doing and where am i heading and um i remember when i was 15 i had like a bunch of things going on at that point and uh i remember most of the conversations at least around me in my high school were all about being popular fitting in and you know doing stuff together so let's can we talk a little bit about the fitting in aspect of it how was that for you given that you were a 15 year old who actually didn't get to partake in the usual 15 year old activities Well, Nishka, I'll be very honest, I never fit in as a child. Or even today, I don't fit in anywhere. Um, I'm a very uh weird juxtaposition of an extrovert and an introvert. So, it's a very difficult melange to understand because um there I was um as a teenager, extremely social, would talk to anybody would be friends with anybody in a, in a minute. You want to be friends? Okay, I'm here. So I'm always so talkative and uh would be uh um, very interested to have a conversation to strike a chord with anyone. But at the same time, I also preferred isolation. Um mm-hmm. uh, because um the things that I was doing, kids of my age were not able to relate to that or even have um more deeper conversation with me. because maybe you could talk with them about policies or about politics or about you know reforms for 5 minutes what after that they would want you to talk about the latest trends in fashion or the boys that are good looking in school right so after some time i did feel that there was a disconnect with my you know peers so i've always um had a very hard time fitting in with the kids um that never ever hampered my self image luckily because um i had a vision for myself because i knew that um i never wanted to be just a popular kid in my school or just to date the most charming handsome boys in my school mm-hmm. i knew that at some point we all have to part our ways uh chase our own routes look for jobs and the usual drill right the ones we are taught of I knew that after a few years our lives are going to be going to be different. So I was very practical and had a vision for myself. So I spent more time with myself than I spent with others. Um and that self time gave me a lot of understanding and clarity as to what I wanted to do with my life. I always knew that if I do I want to be uh good at something whatever that is i do and also give back to my community and also in a way break and transcend all barriers so and i have been taught you have to pursue only one profession you have to do only one thing so i decided from then on that i wanted to do everything and if anybody tells me no it is because not because i am not capable of it it is because they've never done it and they don't know how to do it So I'm going to be doing it at any in any way in any form I will make this happen for myself and set an example for other people as well especially women because we have a lot of self doubt already programmed in our subconscious mind uh that we have to be perfect in every aspect in every dimension whether it is the look aspect mm-hmm. whether it is the grace aspect the the way you sit the way you think and always sacrifice for others that that is something that i never wanted to do i wanted to set an example of how we can live our life better and expand our own horizons um and look beyond beyond the ordinary and uh what most of people call it um of course many people think this is a negative term mediocrity but actually it is a disease which is infecting people every single day mediocrity so we need to rise above that and in order for you to do that you need to first realize that you are capable of infinite things 
So that is something that I realized very early on, even though I never fit in. How? How did you know? As a, it blows my mind, Tenzin. You know, uh, we as adults, especially as women, we struggle even today in our 30s and our 40s, you know, some, God forbid, in their 50s. Um, but here you were, this, you know, super talented 15-year-old. And here you are today. And your self-image is so strong. And your, I think, belief in yourself you know, as I can hear it in your voice, is infectious. And it is, it's beautiful to watch, it's beautiful to hear. So we use, you say that it was something that is within you, right? What was your environment like? Do you think your environment also contributed to the confidence that you had and continue to have? Well, I think it is a support of my mother rather than the environment because environment they keep changing people keep changing circumstances keep changing uh, I cannot be dependent on my confidence and self-image on external factors that are not even constant so um, my mother has been a constant support throughout because she believed that I could do wonders uh, with whatever that is I do and for, for a daughter that is everything um, I'll tell you Nishka that is Everything. It means the world to me when my mom tells me that you are capable of this, you can do this, because um, it gives me um, a vivid um, imagination of tomorrow that I can do it. Right. Um, and nothing is more um, energetic uh, than um, my mom's compliments uh, when when a, when an outsider or a person in, in, in my society you know, compliments is tens and you're doing great work. Um, then, you know, my mother telling me there's a huge difference. It makes me happier. So my mom has been a constant support. Um, and um, I would completely give the credit to her for making me the woman that I am today. Because she always, um, sort of in a way, I've imbibed that from her, that uh, we bring life into the world. We um, tolerate the most painful, um, you know, circumstances, even when we talk about our periods, menstruation, right from our childhood, you know, from our own safety in this world, where we have so many uh, predators around the world, everywhere we live, um, from our safety to menstruation, to marriage, to, to, you know, there's so many things that a woman at every level and stage of her life goes through, that you become so strong. So my mom said, if we can tolerate why cannot we excel and flourish? That sort of magnitude of strength is seen in women. How can we use it in the right direction rather than just tolerating our pain, right? So let us use and channelize our strength in the right direction. And she said, when you grow up and right from now on, now that you're doing all these things, I want you to empower more and more women with your actions, with your behavior, with your thought process, because, you know, together, um, I want you to raise, uh, you know, you should always think that we need to raise a generation of more stronger, more empowered and independent women. Because a lot of women think that we're dependent on our male counterparts or even our parents for that matter. Let me tell you this, if anybody is listening or watching, you are fully capable of being financially independent emotionally independent in every aspect. If you just believe you are capable of being independent, you will be so. Your mom sounds like an amazing person, by the way. <laughs> yeah, she <laughs> sounds you. amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it sounds like you guys have a beautiful, wholesome relationship, which is very, continues to be very positive and very giving. I love that. And, you know, yeah. I would just like to emphasize at this point that it's so important um, to hear those words from our parents, and especially the parent we are close to. It's so important to hear, especially when you're growing up, that, you know what, you can do this and you will do it. And like you rightly said, like hearing it from your mom versus the outside world, it's like, can't even compare the two, right? So, yeah, I think yes. sometimes 
even today when i do something i'm always waiting for my mom to tell me how amazing it is and i'm like yes <laughs> now i feel like i, I have accomplished something <laughs> i know that feeling i know yeah so you know we you spoke about empowerment um so when you say you work um that you you do work and you want to continue working and helping women feel empowered what is what is empowerment for you like what is an empower, empowered woman look like in your eyes well for me i think um from my lens um empowerment doesn't necessarily have to be you know fueling them with ambition but respecting their beliefs because a lot of women just want to be housewives and we must be able to respect their choice um a lot of women just want to do something and we must respect their choice so whatever that is um women want to do let them live with integrity let them live with dignity but at the same time we give them equal opportunities because when we speak of equality for me that is empowerment being independent and being equal for me that is empowerment like for example through my trainings free trainings i teach english for free um focusing more on on women of my community so that they when they go out they don't have to be shy they can communicate with people uh and be more independent and express what they want how they want to go about things because language can be a huge barrier sometimes so for me empowerment is about number 1 of course being independent number 2 being equal being equal um and i'm not saying that we have to you know have this rally against um men um with a flag of feminism we don't have to do that in fact we need men in this movement mm-hmm. but um equality for me is just recognize my worth for example if i'm working in an in an office for a company um uh, and i'm doing the sh- same amount of work as the male counterpart then i must be treated equally and look at my work rather than just my sex or gender because a lot of us we identify work with a specific gender right so we need to stop doing that we need to stop um looking at work and and giving more preference to our gender rather than the work that that happens a lot for me so the moment we we see that we we have shattered the glass ceiling for me i think that will be empowerment and also um on our way to success on our way to being equal and independent if we can just empower and influence other women as well in the path and whatever that is they want to do for those who want to be ambitious support them for those who don't want to be and just want to lead a very peaceful and and satiated life respect them too because everybody has nishka a different principle a sense of life we cannot force our ambition upon them the ones who are interested will come and just support them and whatever that is they do you know i feel like we have very similar ideologies when it comes to empowerment and this is a discussion i feel like i have so often i've been having it for so many years as well um empowerment is the gift of choice when a woman has the gift of choice choose to do i choose to either work raise a family both do nothing as long as it's a choice it is empowerment because you know you often have you often stumble into conversations uh, at least i have stumbled into conversations where you know there is judgment that oh you know she's educated but why isn't she working or yeah like you know she did her master she did a phd why isn't she working she is wasting her education but she's choosing to not do it it's empowerment right similar to women a similar similar judgment is thrown on women who choose to work and not stay at home or choose to do both it's like you know you are judged no matter what you do and the judgment comes from all of us it's from all genders it's not even like um people identify as women are kinder to each other it's not even that so i absolutely resonate with you on that that empowerment is its choice and anybody who has the i think the blessing of choice is empowered and yeah i think it's it's rare that's what it is so i'm glad that i don't know i think i know few women who are like that 
and or you are like that and it's it's always nice to talk to somebody who feels the same way about something like empowerment because empowerment and feminism you know they always get so murky in conversations absolutely agreed it's it's mm-hmm. become a very negative thing now it's yeah. supposed to be very simple it's supposed to just kind of we're all equal give me my rights that's it simple as that it's not a fight and i think exactly. so many urban women especially in in you know bigger metropolitan cities oh you know we need to be feminists and then when when you ask them what have you done um have you ever gone to a village and seen how women live, live? have you helped them with their sanitation this and no we're not aware so what are you talking about you're sitting there writing making a post on social media about feminism but you don't know what's happening in your own country it's very easy for us to say we need to be feminist without really understanding the meaning and actually doing something to help women so th- yeah. that action aspect is really important and also i see as we speak of empowerment one more thing that i like to highlight is um that um women uh, we speak of feminism we speak of so many things but our jealousy for each other uh you know that enviousness that mm-hmm. is something that i don't like we need to stop doing that whether it is about the looks whether it is about succeeding at some point with whatever that is you do in your endeavors real empowerment when you really understand the term uh it really means that you consider each other's success um and cherish each other's success um and the jealous jealousy uh, aspect has to go i think that is very very important oh uh, how do i agree with you more than i'm already agreeing with you i'm trying to find a way and you know what the funny thing is tens and when we spoke i think a week back uh, or i think couple of days ago when i texted you asking you for help mm-hmm. about something and you immediately got back in a couple of hours and then you called me and i called you back and then you helped me out with whatever i was doing and we had a brief conversation about um exactly this that uh, when you reach out for help when anybody reaches out for help it's about collaboration and not about um you know keeping a secret about something and sure. it's so funny because i made a note of that because i knew we were having this podcast or uh, you know conversation and uh, i made a note and i thought to myself that i want to bring this up with tenzin because it is important um because at this moment right now there are so many of us creating content online and just creating as a means to um survive as a means to thrive as a means to figure ourselves out and just the joy of you know having these conversations or just creating in whatever form and the moment um there is this aspect of you know competing in a way that doesn't make sense you know like you're actually not competing for the same thing everybody has very different goals but the moment that comes in collaboration just falls like through the roof and you can almost sense it like i think um, and there's this there's this you know conversation which also happens that everybody's happy with your success as long as you are succeeding within their parameters of how much you should succeed right like you know i'm sure you understand what i'm saying like if to just give you an example um i don't even know how to make up a a very <laughs> mean example <laughs> right i'm like i've never had a thought like this where somebody's asked me for help and i felt like why should i help them they're going to take mm-hmm. away from me i've actually never had that feeling and i have often been told that um I'm a bit too helpful and I don't see that as a bad thing. I'm like if somebody asks me for something, it takes so much to ask somebody for something. It takes you know, you are being vulnerable by asking somebody for help. So if somebody's reaching out to you, how could you like how could you be mean and how could you see at them as competition and even if they are competition? What's the harm in helping a competition get better? true true i think that is um uh, very aptly put nishika and i know that you were not able to uh you know cook a very mean example yeah. uh, <laughs> well i couldn't I mean, think of anything 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think whether you're a content creator or whatever that is you do, um, there's nothing wrong in sharing your secrets. Uh, how you, for example, uh, create something or how you do something. If if somebody asks you for help and more more so or a, a woman or a female, right, you must definitely help that person because uh, we've been always, uh, you know, sort of in a way told this fodder that in our in our brain that's been fed is that um, you know only the the good looking girl or the best girl will get the prince charming or only the best girl will have the opportunities. So in order for you to succeed, you need to trample upon someone or squander them to succeed, which is a very wrong mindset. It's very unhealthy uh, because this is also eating you up from inside. All these things, they're doing harm than good, not just for the person opposite to you, but also the one who is inside you that is yourself. Because I personally think that um, whatever that is you do, you must be able to share with them. When you reached out to me with, with some help, I, I wanted to do it. And also I said that today, if I'm kind to you, maybe you will be kind to someone else because it's a cycle. Uh, it's a cycle just like, um, you know, negativity is a cycle. Uh, hatred is a cycle. Um, you know, happiness, kindness, and compassion is also a cycle. So uh, what do you do? You, you reap what you sow, right? That is the effect of karma. So I believe in karma. Um, and, uh, you know, as we spoke about it earlier, empowerment really is about, um, you know, uh, looking at women um, and really understanding their capabilities, being supportive with one another, not just with our words, with our action as well. Uh, yes, just by being supportive with your kind words would do, but action is necessary in this field really necessary when someone really comes out and reach, reaches out to you for help please help women please help each other because the whole pillar of sisterhood um, dilapidates when you are envious when you don't help one another so we need to really fathom that very very important absolutely like goodness is infectious it's as simple as that yeah so I would love to talk a little bit about um, the kind of work you do today. So you are deep, you have a very deep passion for communication. And uh, you also love helping people find a way to communicate. So what is that like for you? Where did you find this passion? And uh, how do you help people today? Well, I found this passion uh, again when I was a teenager. Uh, as I was lost in my world of imagination and, and possibilities, I was reading um, a bit about Nelson Mandela and Gandhiji, and I was very, very inquisitive, and also at the same point, astounded by the fact that the world leaders that we've had in our history, from eons, actually, have just impacted and changed our world with just their speech so their speech stirred emotions you know their speeches um were able to change perspectives um even when we speak of the the british era in india you know freedom fighters with just their speech were able to evoke patriotism uh, so the speech the communication could do so much the world with communication, we're able to share our knowledge. With communication, we're able to thrive because we've moved away from living in survival mode as you know, early men or early women in the forest because we've used communication for survival to signal each other from the threats or dangers um, for the life in the forest, of the life in the forests, from animals and natural calamities. We've moved away from that mode and we've now started to understand that communication is not just for survival but for us to thrive because imagine if somebody never communicated nobody communi- communicated we've never had had language and if we never had language uh our intelligence would never be as sharpened our cognition wouldn't be as sharpened so uh right from a young age i understood that communication has a massive massive role to play 
And if so many of these important personalities in the world have impacted and changed the world just with their communication, imagine what I can do and how I can shape and impact the lives of future children of the future with my communication. I deal with a lot of people from diverse bandwidths, um, you know, who want to enhance their personal image and also improve their communication skills, whether it is the verbal aspect or the nonverbal communication, right? Because both of these have to be in sync to be able to portray your right image and to be more confident. Because I can be here, uh, talk to you, um, you know, say the most wonderful things in a more precise and articulate manner. But if my body language, my facial expressions, um, they're not displaying my confidence, then it is not in sync with my speech, right? So I do work with that part, with that section. I train a lot of people, whether it is entrepreneurs, CEOs of various, uh, you know, companies, diplomats. You know, also, I, I do have a few people who are trying to, you know, get into the pageants, the models who wanted to improve their communication because, you know, you have the question and answer round in, in you know, mm -hmm. in all these national and international pageants. So I prepare them for their, uh, you know, communication skills. Um, yeah, so it's it's been a wonderful experience for me. It's been surreal because you're able to, um, you know, help people and hold their hand and show them a beautiful future. Um, and also all these ideas that are actually wested in them, all these treasures uh, of, of experiences and ideas that are in them, you're able to bring that out by enhancing their communication so that they can communicate better with the world and thereby also attract more opportunities in their own industries. Yeah, I love that because I love, I love, I love when you said that you're helping people kind of just realize what's deep within them and giving them the tools to put that into words and then into actions and then just creating a ripple effect of just good work. That's amazing. So tell me, what's, what's your biggest motivator today? What motivates you to wake up every day, you know, be this kick ass person that you are? Help them. He's help people find their voice um, and give them the tools to communicate. Plus, also take our time for social work as well. And I know that you are very um, driven by giving back. Um, but what what are your personal goals like that keep you motivated? Well, I do have goals that um, you know keep me motivated that drive me. But the biggest motivator for me is my death. Because not a lot of us, we, we tend to think about our death. When I think about my death, I realize I have a very short period of time on this blue planet. And then I, I, I think, oh, no, I don't want to waste my uh, time or my energy. Um, I want to be able to do everything. Look, I have we have so many countries in this world, so many unknown, unexplored landscapes that I want to go visit, talk to people, you know, taste all kinds of cuisines you know, wear traditional costumes from around the world, um, you know, go to these really mysterious places. And there's so much in me that wants to explore, that wants to seek. Um, and uh, I'm a very spiritual person like that, more than religious. Um, the biggest motivator for me, because I'm spiritual, is my death. Because I keep reminding myself at least once a day of my death. When I do it, then my actions are more... Uh, I would say good and my morality in terms of uh, ethics, right? Ethics, they're better because I realize if I have a short period of time that I'm a temporary guest here, uh, then I will be kinder to people. I will be uh, more helpful. I will be less mean and it will keep me grounded, right? It keeps me grounded because when you start to accomplish a lot of things so young, um, as I started young, and I'm still doing so many things side by side, um, it's quite possible that you may develop a sense of I know everything. So that has luckily never happened with me because I always try to keep myself grounded no matter where I reach. Again, my mom has played a very important mm -hmm. role. She's always, always told me that no matter how far you go and how high you go, 
always remember to look down and see where you started. Being humble, you know, having that humility is really important, no matter where you reach. Because where you reach does not um, mean that is your identity. It is just a route that you traveled. It doesn't mm -hmm. define you. You are who you are at heart. You are who you are in real. And the path that you covered doesn't necessarily talk about you. You know, it talks about the choices that you made, yes, but it doesn't necessarily define you rigidly. So in that way, definitely, I feel that um, death is a big motivator for me. And talking about my goals, something that also motiva motivates me uh, more, more so is um, that I wanted to help my community, that I want to help my community because there's there's a lot of, um, you know, stuff that needs to be uh, improved in my community, whether it is uh, more employment opportunities, whether it is more education, whether it is just in the sense of, uh, as I mentioned before, helping them to be more ambitious, encouraging them to be more ambitious, Um the ones, of course, who are interested to do something in life and who want to be who want to be more ambitious. For those who don't want to be, of course, I respect that. But for those who want to do something, I'm always here to help. You can reach out to me whenever you want to. Um, and uh, for me, the biggest goal currently has been to publish my book. I'm currently working on my book. So hopefully when that is done, um, that will be my first um, sort of in a way, milestone. Once that is done, then I, oh, you keep having milestone. That never ends. Oh, we keep having goals um, until I'm, I think even I'm buried um, on, on the day of my death, I will still have one goal, which I, I will say, oh, I wish I would have done that. So humans are like that. We always want to keep doing something. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I am this way. I'm designed this way. Can't help it, Nishka. Um, that is the um, best way to be designed, I feel. You're saying you can't <laughs> help it, Tenzin. I love it. You're amazing. Um, okay, so when you say death is a motivator, um, it sounds really cool in theory, you know, I feel, because it's it seems like something which is a lot more evolved. Um, it's not like you're making a joke. It comes from a very deep place that you understand that life is fleeting. And I think the pandemic has made that very, very apparent, right? Um, and the fact that you're using it as a motivator, it's it's so positive. I love it. I want to think about this a lot, actually, after our conversation. It's given me a lot to think about because I have never, um, frankly, never thought about death. And uh, far from thinking of it as a motivator. So that's some good food for thought for me as well. Right. Yeah. And for me, uh, the reason why um, I started to think about death is because as a young girl, I've had, because I never fit in, uh, and also because I was a little isolated, I was lost in my own world of books, of, of you know, um, working so hard and being this really um, ambitious girl, um, I had anxiety attacks. So... Um, when you when you have when you encounter these attacks when you actually go through that your heart rate it, it, it races it palpitates right and your short, shortness of breath is seen it almost feels like you are going to die and at that moment you realize that okay so my life is only only a breath away is only a breath away so if I just take that last breath if things don't work out well this may be my last day. This may be my last moment. So I've seen as a person who suffered from anxiety and depression, maybe not clinically, but I have, um, you know, been through that, been through that phase of anxiety and panic. So when you've, when you've gone through these challenges, you somehow, um, you know, touch the line of death and come back. It's, it's like that. To me, it, it felt like that. And so uh, that is the reason why, and that is how I started to think more about death and, uh, and how we brand death is really scary. We think of death as a very scary thing, but to be honest, when you're close to death, uh, you know, your whole life sort of in a way comes in front of you. It appears in flashes. And then the feelings that you're having while you're near 
your death or feeling that you're near your death, how do you feel? Do you feel you've done enough good on this planet? Do you think you've done enough? Uh, so when I think about my death, I always say that when I'm near my death, when I'm entering that door of another dimension, if we call it that way to sound more fancy, <laughs> what is the feeling that I'm going to have? What is the feeling that Tenzin is going to have? Is she going to say, well, I loved people. I lived well. I spent a lot of time laughing. I, I enjoyed my life. Also helped so many people on the way. Did I, do I have that feeling or do I have a, I wish I could have done better. If that is a feeling that I'm getting, then no, no regrets. I don't want to have any regrets. I'm going to live every day like there's no tomorrow. I love that so much. <laughs> And, you know, I, I feel like it takes a very, um, I think very self-aware person to look at death from, I think from such a, um, a very giving lens, because you're not looking at it as something that is taking away from you. You're looking at it as something that is giving you more to live for, that you want to live every day, like to the fullest, like actually live it to the fullest by doing everything that you love, that is giving, communicating, communicating, helping creating and you know attending podcast conversations so it's it's phenomenal i absolutely love that so thank you for sharing that yeah thank you i appreciate it so uh, before we wrap up i do want to talk about how you spend a lot of time teaching young girls language skills i just want to dig a little deeper into that on um, how do you do it um how do you reach out and are like how are you mobilizing this entire endeavor of yours and um, how's it been going for you well in the year 2012 i started something called the dropout awareness program where i worked in collaboration with the tibetan government and exiled local tibetan administration in the tibetan settlements and i teamed up with all the schools uh, there were two major schools uh, there is the tibetan children's village and there's central school for tibetans in india So I teamed up with them and uh, I would go there for uh, two months and it was a two month program. So um, I was working with two schools side by side together and um, post their classes or somewhere when they're, you know, you have all these periods, right? You have the science class, the math class. So somewhere in between, they would put and arrange for my class. Mm -hmm. wherein I talk about why they shouldn't drop out because the dropout rate in my community um, is a little high. Could be because um, many believe that they want to just pursue traditional businesses or just be entrepreneurs or could be many other factors as well, societal factors, cultural factors, social factors. There's so many things as we dig deeper. But uh, dropout awareness program is something that I started in 2012 where I would teach children Uh, soft skills, and that also included girls in, in the community. Um, I would teach them how they could go ahead with their career um, you know, choices and how they could be successful in their own career. So that is something that I started. And now I think uh, I've taught over, let's say, 700 plus students, uh, considering both the schools uh, right from uh, seventh grade to 12th grade. In both of these schools, and also, um, uh, you know, they would reach out to me privately and bring more of their friends. They say, you know, uh, Tenzin Mam has so many things to share. So best thing, it's free. So who doesn't want free advice and free uh, consulting, right? Um, there was this girl, young girl, um, one of one, one of my students. Her parents uh, divorced her into taking up science. Because, you know, somehow it is an Asian belief that if you take up science as your stream, you're more intelligent and, you know, all these myths mm -hmm. that we have. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a usual thing. So yeah. uh, she came to me, she came up to me and she, and she said that, you know, this is not something that I enjoy very much, uh, ma'am. And I wanted to do something more of an arts and something that you do, like, you know, you teach uh, kids and you're doing so much work. So I want to do something like that because I enjoy communicating. I said, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your energy, your resources. You're wasting um, everything. So she said, now, how do I, you know, tell my parents? Because they're never going to agree. You know how Asian parents are. 
And I said, I know first thing you need you need to understand is you need to have a little compassion for your parents because they come from a different generation. And in their generation, during their time, it was the only stream. So they think doing that is the right thing. Maybe that is their way of caring for you and wishing well for you without understanding that they're actually doing the opposite. So it is quite possible that they don't know. So the first thing that you need to do is educate them to uh, or sort of them, you know, telling them to help them and support them in whatever you want to do. So she went up to them. She said, you know, um, in arts, you can do so many things and this and that. And their parents were okay. Come see, come sa. They were almost okay and not okay because they're scared about their child's future. And then she said, I educated them about this, but they were um, okay and not okay about it. Now, what do I do? So the parents reached out to me. I reached out to the parents. I called them. I told them that, you know, I'm this. I said, oh, this is Tenzin. They're like, oh, we know about you. We know about you. And you've been doing so much work. You've been translating for us. If you are saying this, it should be right. So that moment, that trust that people lay upon me, yeah. lay on me, you know, the way they trust me, uh, my people, that is something that I'm extremely grateful for extremely grateful for now she's doing arts and she's doing wonderful wow so uh, today as well during this pandemic as i have a lot of work still i always try to find the time to consult and train young girls and uh, kids of all you know um, genders kids both male and female but both uh, boys and girls uh, help them with their career, help them with their communication skills and English. I do that whenever I have the time. So we have actually a batch, a group of kids. We assemble Sundays. We have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about, uh, they talk about, ma'am, I want to do this when I grow up. I want to be a pilot. And I say, okay, but what do you need to do to get there? What are the steps that you need to have? So we have these kind of sessions even today on Zoom. And uh, I guess they've enjoyed my session so much that to this day, from 2012, they still reach out to me and, you know, they call me and they say that we want to learn more from you. So um, I always, always try my best to uh, show them that there is a beautiful future, despite what is going around in this world now, going on in this world, because we need to look away and look beyond our present uh, difficulties. because. You know, we've had this kind of uh, virus before in 1918 to 1920 in uh, Bombay, in Mumbai, for two years. It was called the Spanish influenza, um, and it lasted for two years. So we've co we coped with it, right? How do we cope with it? We've had wars. The world has seen wars. We coped with it. So we will cope with this, too. This, too, shall pass. I know this is difficult, but this, too, shall pass. So I try to always show uh, the young kids a better future and equip them for their better future. That's wonderful, Tenzin. Gosh, I love how much you do. I honestly do. I think it's so, it's infectious. Just listening to you, I want to do more. Like, I always feel like I'm doing so many things that I love to do. And whenever I talk to you, I almost, al almost always feel motivated to do something new. I'm like, you know what? This is amazing. Like, look at the impact. Look at how, um, like, how much goodness you are spreading and how much is coming back to you. And it's it's such a crazy effect. And I think that's my biggest takeaway from actually talking to you and having a conversation with you. And when you allow, like, us to peek into your life, I think that's such a fantastic takeaway that you're doing everything. It's absolutely altruistic. And look at the insane karma that you're creating not just for yourself but i think for everybody you are coming in contact with and that's it's freaking beautiful i absolutely love it thank you so much nishka because you know everybody's going some through something maybe you can't see them uh you know suffering maybe you know they're just smiling externally but maybe they have a lot of pain so you never know what is going on in people's minds and what is happening in their lives. So always try to be more kind. And uh, that is what I want to do. I'm so glad that you felt motivated. And I believe that you resonate with 
whatever that is I do. I really appreciate that because that is what I want, really. That is real success for me when my presence, when my words, when my story is able to spark something in you. For me, I think uh, that really makes my day. So thank you so much. Nishka. Yeah, I can tell you're like glowing. You're glowing a different glow at the end of this conversation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I really appreciate it, Nishka. Thank you. Of course, Tenzin. And I feel like you're one of those people who um, actually does as they say. You know, we always talk about the kind of work we do and um, the kind of impact we want to leave. Um, you're one of those people that I've come in contact with who is authentic through and through. Like when I hear about the stuff you do, when I hear the way you talk about it, um, like, I know you're living like your most authentic life and it's very motivating and it's very inspiring. And I'm sure people who are listening, um, it's definitely going to give them something to think about. And that's exactly what we want out of these conversations that we are having on Raise the Brow. So I'm happy. Thank you so much, Nishka. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And also, you know, with the with the Tenzin show, I try to do the same thing, right? To spread motivation, to, to have that positive outlook on life. That is so all my energy, um, everything that I do is directed in that direction. Can we talk a little bit about your podcast? Like you have a podcast. I have uh, you recently launched it. I know you were doing a lot of interviews and you used to post them on Instagram. And now you have moved on to the podcasting platform as well. So welcome. Um, how has that been for you? And what is the what is the aim and goal for the podcast? Well, I started the Tenzin show um, a year ago. It's almost a year, I think. It's going to be, um, we're going to have the anniversary of the Tenzin show in June 16th. So we Ooh. still have some time to go for that. I started with the mindset that, you know, during the pandemic, everybody's morale were down because everybody was uncertain. When it first broke out, people went all crazy, right? They were like, what is this? This is completely alien to us, unknown to us. So this is human nature and instinct that everything that's new and unknown, it's scary, right? We see that as a threat. And so there, there was a lot of, um, you know, mayhem uh, around uh, the whole uh, pandemic situation. So I thought I need to do something uh, that could uh, show people a better tomorrow. And also, I myself, I was very curious about understanding success because we speak of success everywhere, what is success? But actually hearing, listening to successful people, um, you know, talk about their own journeys and also give their own perspective on success. That is something that I found really interesting. And that is what we do on the Tenzin show, whether it is people from the entertainment industry, whether it's Bollywood or Hollywood, whether it's authors, scientists, researchers, athletes, you know, social workers. We try to bring people from all of these diverse backgrounds and, you know, um, ask them about their journeys of how they have carved their own way of success. And what is success according to them? What is success from their vantage point? So something that um, most of the people have been curious about myself is what is success? Because it can be very perplexing for people to understand what that could mean, right? So with the Tenzin show, we try to cover that. So the major objective is to bring about positivity in people and, and sort of in a way a show that if they can do it, then you could do it too. Um, you could call it a blueprint for success, but uh, I'm not saying that you have to copy paste their method, but I'm just saying take a, you know all these good points from each of these journeys, each of these people who have uh, you know uh, carved their own way of success. So the Tenzin show is a little bit about that. It, it, it started on Instagram. Uh, it is a digital talk show. And, and uh, now, yes, I'm in the podcast world, in the podcast world. It is now on all podcasting platforms. Also going to be a little more active on YouTube. Uh, for me, the biggest challenge, Nishka, to be honest, was that I was never a social media person before because I'm super sensitive. I'm extremely sensitive. Um, so now I have started to understand that I could use social media and not be affected by it, whether it's the trolls. I don't usually get a lot of them, but 
But if there's, you know, uh, occasional trolls that I read, um, I've gotten a little more thick skin now, I can say. Uh, a little more thick skin because I've understood it's very easy to type in anything that they want. It is very weak of them, actually, mentally to do it because I can catch them. So that is the reason why they're typing it. If they were physically here, they would be very scared, scared of me. They won't be able to do it. So it's because it's, it's social media, the pool of social media, the world of social media has given anonymous people the right to mm -hmm. you know, type out everything that, we, that they want without understanding mm -hmm. how the reader may feel about their comment. I've understood that, uh, oh my God, this is a really weak person who doesn't have self-esteem or doesn't have the value of their time because they're using their uh, you know, time to spread so much negativity. So. Yeah. For me, the biggest challenge was that I was very sensitive, but with the Tencent show, I have grown stronger in the world of social media, learn to explore, learn to be more thick-skinned. Yeah, fantastic. It's going to serve you very well in your podcasting career and in YouTube as well, because that's where the real fun is. Um, yeah. And you know, that's the thing with social media. At no point can you start getting used by it. Because that's that's a scary place to be, and it's easy to fall into that. It happens to all of us, and you know this is a this is a theme of conversation which comes up with almost ninety percent of my guests, um, because everybody's doing something online, and their biggest learnings and takeaways are always the same: that don't let social media use you. Find a way to use it, social and media. yeah, and detach from it, and it's. It, it's been serving me very well, and I think it's a fantastic learning to take away. So um, I'm excited for your YouTube channel as well. So that's going to be fun. Thank you so um, much. I'm of excited. course. I yeah, know. I can see. <laughs> <laughs> so before we wrap up, um, I would love to ask you um, a question I ask all my guests. Um, and um, I think you know the question, but I'm going to ask you very formally. Um, so how do you think we as a community can raise the bar for ourselves individually and by doing so raise the bar for everybody around us? And I know we've spoken about this quite a bit <laughs> in our conversation already, but I would love just, a, a, you know, like a small a parting message on how you think we can raise the bar as individuals. Well, um, to begin with, you must first understand what does raising the bar mean to you? Because everybody may have a different outlook of that. For someone, raising the bar may be standing up for truth. For somebody, raising uh, the bar may mean that they will succeed in their career. For someone, raising the bar could mean, you know, helping other people. So uh, the, the whole idea of, of raising the bar could be different for different people. So whatever your idea is, be religious to that, stick to that, and do it. Um, irrespective of whatever challenges, whatever barriers, what circumstances, raise the bar by raising your bar. Uh, and how I say that is you can raise the bar in your community, in your society, um, by yourself first raising the bar, that is working on yourself. Um, for me, the most important thing uh, for you to even start raising the bar outside is to first have your own self-esteem. And I think that is the first way to raise your own bar in your own eyes. Um, by, um, let's say, investing in your health, by, let's say, writing down your goals and achieving them, by actually not just planning, but doing that. Um, because a lot of us, we have, you know, we know a lot of people in our lives. Uh, we, we, we know what they want, what they would like to hear, what they would like to have, but we seldom take the time to understand what we want. So you can raise the bar by first understanding your own needs, by working on yourself and being a better version of yourself. That is how you raise your own bar. Once you've done so, then you can, you know, preach what you've learned, what you are, that you're an example of, and then you can do the good that you want to do, whether it is, as I said, by helping other people, by educating, by doing something that matters, um, that can make the world a better place to live 
than it was before. So how can you contribute to uh, you know, the world? I think that is how you raise the bar. Fantastic answer. I give it a 10 on 10 as I'm the only person judging it here. Yes. And I know you're biased because you like me, isn't it? I know. <laughs> I'm very biased. <laughs> I'm Absolutely. the worst judge. <laughs> yeah. And I thought I liked you, but during this conversation, I like you even more now. And I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I like this judge. I like Nishka because she yeah. gives me 10 yeah. on 10. So it's good. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Tenzin, it was super amazing having you. Uh, I'm a big fan. You already know that. And um, I think you're an insane inspiration and you are very motivating. And I, I just love watching the way you live. And I hope that our listeners also feel the way I feel. So thank you so much for being on Race the Brow and sharing your a chapter of your life with us. Thank you so much, Nishka, for having me. It was a really super fun conversation that I had with you. Uh, you wouldn't believe I had this uh, paper in my hand while I was speaking to you throughout this conversation, because when I think, I usually roll a paper underneath. Nobody sees that on camera, but I usually have the habit of doing so, uh, because I think a lot, and this is like my stress ball could call it that way when you have so much to do so much to think you keep rolling the paper it's like my fidgeting friend i think that's amazing because i usually play with my pencil or my hair tie the paper you is a good idea yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so thank you so much for having me nishka it was, it was wonderful speaking with you and uh you asked all these questions so wonderfully you are a gracious host and you yourself are a very empowering woman i think um that is something that I know for sure. You're really, really a badass woman. Yeah, thank you so much. This is going to help me sleep today. <laughs>